Hi, I'm Roger Michaud. At Franklin Templeton Investments, we believe that citizens need to be informed about the resources that can help make higher education more affordable. That's why we're proud to support programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation and their partners in public television. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by Activists, the New Jersey Education Association, working for great public schools for every child. Investors Bank, New Jersey Natural Gas, proud to support education in our communities. St. Peter's University, the Jesuit University of New Jersey. And by New Jersey Manufacturers Insurance Group, auto insurance, homeowners insurance, and banking under the principle of stewardship. Promotional support provided by the Star Ledger and NJ.com, everything Jersey. And by the New Jersey Business and Industry Association and its monthly magazine, New Jersey Business. This is One on One. When you first heard that they were doing Charlie Rose and Gail King, didn't you go, what? People like laughing at others, so I don't mind if the other is me. See, you go right into the character. That's what it is. <laughs> I'm bringing families together a half an hour each week. Man, I'm doing something special. And so I do feel successful. Welcome to One on One. I'm Steve Adubato. I want to introduce for the first time in One on One, Lisa Soriano who is the founder and CEO of a company called Feducation, yes. which is all about what? It's a culinary nutrition education program for children and families. Where'd you come up with this idea? I, um, I was working, my family business is private school food service, so I was already teaching, um, doing personal training and, and working in the fitness industry as well, and I was really passionate about health and nutrition, and I was trying to sell vegetables in schools to kids with sell vegetables to kids in school yes sell them to get them to to eat them and and want to put them on their on their plate at lunchtime go to the salad bar and make a varied selection and um, I had no marketing materials to do that at a business background and I believe in the power of marketing by the way what we're looking at here is we got a, a vegetation activity book right we're about to show a video clip about vegetation, uh, vegetation recipes. One of the things that's fascinating is that all of the vegetables are a brand in and of themselves, right? Yes. Explain that, by the way. I wanted to, I felt vegetables were unbranded and I wanted to brand the unbranded. Um, for example? For example, I mean, you know, there's, there's brands of everything, of cereal, of bread, um, even we've branded our meat. Um, but we haven't really taken hold of a brand of vegetables. So hold on, does that mean, uh, is it silky pumpkin soup? Silky pumpkin That's soup. That's a brand. Not, yep. Roasted butternut squash with cinnamon, a brand. Yes. Snap peas with carrot ginger dressing, a brand. Well, uh, when a vegetable has a brand, how does it change the vegetable? Well, we're, we're pr uh, programmed to be brand loyal. So, you know, we, we really get into that silky pumpkin soup, and that's, that's our pumpkin soup, and that's what we like, and it becomes a comfort food, um, just like a packaged food would. Um, something that we can be empowered to make, and that it becomes our sil silky pumpkin soup. Where do the cartoon characters come in? Because in the coloring book, the, this book, mm -hmm. which our daughter Olivia, uh, very daughter, it's not like we have a 15-year-old daughter, she's two turning three, as we do the program, the Vegetation Activity book, she started coloring Guys, Bob, can you get a shot of this? This is Olivia's coloring. She'll love this. Bob, take a shot of this. You can talk about this. This is Olivia's great coloring. Zoom in on this if you could. John, zoom in on this. Um, talk about this. Well, children are attracted to cartoon characters and, and bright colors. Um, and the research shows us that when something is branded with cartoon marketing, that children report that it actually tastes better. So you could give them the exact same cookie and one that's branded with a familiar character like Scooby-Doo, and one that's unbranded. And nine times out of 10, the children will say that the one that's branded tastes better. So I wanted to help people you know, say, oh, vegetables don't taste good, which is not true. But um, you know, they have that perception, so I wanted to change that perception and give us the edge when it came to marketing Set up vegetables. the video we're about to see. Sure, this is a, um, a sample video of one of our Healthy Kids cooking classes, because we want to empower kids to know that they, they can prepare foods. Um, there is no home ec really in school anymore, so we need to educate ourselves on how to make simple, easy, delicious meals. As Warner Wolf uh, used to say, let's go to the videotape. Vegetation across the nation, coming to your schools, because veggies rule. Vegetation across the nation, come and get a minute and let the fun begin. Yeah! 
So it's fun. Yes. The reaction you've gotten, because right now you're in 30 U.S. schools? Uh, states. School, oh, excuse me, yeah. 30, 30, 30 states. We've been picked up in schools in 30 states in the USA. How do you get into a state that says, yes, you can come into our school? The How internet is an amazing thing. Um, you know, I did a lot with social media when I started out um, on blogs and, and getting to know other people who are nutrition advocates in school, um, blogging with them, commenting, Facebook, Twitter, you know, the whole gamut of social media platforms. And that's how people found out about us and came to our website and found our recipes, our materials, our, our posters that we have for cafeterias and school hallways that educate people about really relevant information about vegetables and why they're so good for us. Um, and they've been picked up all over. Canada as well. Yes, two schools in Canada. We went international. So that was exciting. Let me ask you something. Do you think, because our, our kids, uh, some of our kids are into vegetables, some are not. Let's just say that. Mm -hmm. uh, and the one, you know who you are, who is not. <laughs> We've tried so many different ways. He's convinced he doesn't like certain vegetables, and we're convinced he just hasn't tried those yes. vegetables. Mm -hmm. How much of it is just getting the kid to try? Uh, it's a huge part of it. And I also, I've learned through this process, um, through working with so many different children and so many different parents, um, coming from someone else, not coming from the parent, really <laughs> makes a big difference. I, we teach these classes in Whole Foods Market, um, and I have Yeah, talk about the Whole Foods Connection. Well, Whole Foods, actually, my, my illustrator, Lauren Roth, um, was a sign maker for Whole Foods and introduced me to one of their marketers. And one thing led to another. We started doing monthly healthy kids cooking classes. And then that expanded from one market on the Upper West Side of Manhattan to 23 markets in their Northeast region within eight months. Um, so we expanded very quickly, and now we're um, working on a larger expansion with the company. And um, it's been really successful. The people love getting their kids to be exposed to vegetables, and it's not them just doing it, and it's not just mommy saying, eat this. They're being empowered. They're learning why it's good for their body, not just that it has folate. Who cares what folate is? Um, but what do they care about? They care that it's going to make them think faster in school, or it's going to make them run faster on, on the soccer field, um, that it's going to make their hair look prettier and their skin look, look clean. Um, they love that stuff, and so that's how we message the marketing messaging of vegetables to them. And then we get them hands-on. We get them smelling it, tasting it, cooking with it, and it's their recipe. And then, even the, the resistant ones will we'll eventually try it once they see their peers trying it, so that positive peer pressure. Barbara, you grew up in an environment where vegetables were all around, right? Before yeah. I let you go, tell folks about that. Uh, well, my, my grandfather was a farmer in Queens, if you can believe that, and then... Um, what are we looking at right there? That's me and my grandfather and my grandmother. In Get our, out of here. Yeah, that's in our, Queens? Um, no, that was actually in Emerson, New Jersey. My right. dad brought us all out there, and my grandfather turned our backyard into his little farm. That is great. So I grew up with peppers and zucchinis and learning how to um, tend the garden, and I would just go and pick, you know, pick some green beans or enjoy some fresh basil. The Italian family? Yes, Italian family. Tough folks with Bosnia and uh, That's uh, clams, <laughs> yeah? <laughs> no. Bosnia and Nagol. see... In southern Italy, the Fasano Gol, you know. The oh, the beans. No. No. <laughs> oh, my gosh. You know. <laughs> my dad's going to be so embarrassed. <laughs> okay, go home and ask what Fasano Gol is. I'm going to have to. Because it's a certain kind of, it it's like else. a parsley. Oh, yes. Okay. It's like mm -hmm. after you do the pasta, mm -hmm. just drop At it in. At the end, yes. Right? Mm -hmm. It's the stuff my son says, take the green stuff out. Take the green stuff out. I would you, get him loving that parsley. You love the green stuff. Yes, I do. I really do. It becomes something that you need and you, and you crave it. Uh, because it makes you feel so good. It's interesting. You grew up around it, so you're comfortable with it, mm -hmm. and, and you've made it not just um, a living, but it's a passion for you. Absolutely. Keep it up. And it, when it comes again, it's called Vegication? Vegication, yes. Go, folks, on the website, find out more. Lisa Soriano, founder and CEO, wish you nothing but the best. Thank you so much. Thanks. Stay right there. Stay tuned. One-on-one. -on -one. We'll be right back right after this. Pause and a goal. If you would like more information on this program or if you'd like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org, visit us online at oneonone.org, or find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD. Dr. Andrew Kaufman, Director of University Hospital Comprehensive Pain Center and Associate Professor of Anesthesiology. Rutgers, New Jersey Medical School. Good to see you, doctor. Thank you for having me today. Um, we're talking about the abuse of prescription medication. Yes. Is it an epidemic in this country? Yes, it is. Describe it. The problem is that prescription medication should be for a purpose. 
you go to a doctor, you have a complaint, an injury, especially with a pain medication, medicine is given to you. The problem that we have is twofold. One, there are unscrupulous doctors who are prescribing for benefit and people are getting arrested, the DEA is aware of that. The other problem is people are giving medicines, however, I want to say they give too much and then the patient doesn't need it anymore and then what happens? It's left in their medicine cabinet. For example, pain medication, um, say it's Vicodin, you, you need, I don't know, 10, you get prescribed 20. You got, what do you do? The problem is that you're stuck with those medications. Legally, you can't dump them, but we do encourage people to get rid of them. We don't want them there. There are some programs, but they're far and few between to bring them to police stations. Pharmacies won't take them back. They don't want to have them. By the way, time out. Go on our website. We have a whole other program that we're doing, a whole other series talking about how to safely uh, get rid of your prescription medication. But the problem is public awareness isn't what it needs to be. That's correct. So what do you do with the 10 extra Vicodin, right? They sit there. They sit there for years and years and years. I have patients that will come in and will go over medications and I'll ask them, what are you taking? Well, I took Vicodin, for instance, five years ago. And they go, well, I still have some left. And I said, whoa, whoa, time out. Why do you still have that? Well, no one ever told me to get rid of it. So there is the problem. People have these medicines laying around and the house. And what happens to them? What well, happens, what, that medication, 10 extra Vicodin, it's just stay with the Vicodin. It's sitting there. Say someone is in their house, you know, just say. Do people actually go into other people's People don't actually go to other people's cabinets. Yes, they do. They don't. Yes, they do. You'd be they amazed. Don't. Actually, one of the biggest problems right now is that during open house season, and uh, open house season in New Jersey, popular sales time, there are gangs that will go around going to open houses, and then they're shopping for medicines, not houses. So they actually go into yeah. the medicine cabinets. Well, they say, I need to use the bathroom. They close the door. They go through the medicine cabinet. They take the medicines. I then get patients who have been homeowners doing that, saying, I had the medicine stolen. I say, well, you need to fill out a police report. You need to lock these things up. People will look for them. Your children's friends may look for the medicines. Wow. And so some of the things that we need to do as we increase public awareness about this problem, is, problem of abuse of prescription drugs. Go through it, doctor. Well, the problem with abuse of prescription drugs, it, it, abuse and misuse. You want to do You want to do two things with that. And by the way, how do you distinguish? Well, the misuse is that you're taking it and given for an appropriate reason. And then someone says to you, oh, I sprained my ankle a friend, a family member, and you go, you know what, don't go to the doctor, we'll go away, let me give you something that I have. That's misuse of the medicine. How do we know, or how, does they, how do they know, that they're not going to have a reaction to the medicine, that they're not allergic to the medicine, that's going to have an adverse effect, and if they do, we don't know what they took. Right. They can't call someone and say, I took the medicine you gave me. So that's a misuse of the medication. Abuse of the medication is where we have patients who willfully go doctor shopping. They go to Dr. A, Dr. B, Dr. C. They're trying to get medicines, maybe for the right reason. They have bad back pain. They have bad arthritis. But they're doctor shopping going to different people to try to get medicines. Now, we have ways to combat that, however, in the state. Okay. I want to be clear about young people, younger people abusing, using prescription drugs and the potential it has as a gateway to other more dangerous, even more dangerous drugs. Talk about that. Well, it's been in the news left and right now where younger people are starting with, and you don't want to say cliche, but they're starting with, medi not medications, but they're moving from marijuana, and then they're going to prescription pills. And they're getting them from parents that are laying around, from friends, hey, try this. And then we know that there's a heroin epidemic now in northern New Jersey. And that's been very well documented. And when you read through these reports, they say, I started with this and we're moving to other medicines. Throughout the state. I mean, we throughout said Northern state. Jersey was really throughout the state. Absolutely. So, so go back, though. Uh, go back. I want to give people some more tangible advice. What should a parent watching right now, three things he or she can do to reduce the risk that a prescription drug in or around the house is going to be abused? First thing is this. Let's say you actually need the medicine. You have no choice. Right. You need to get a safe. You need to have a, a safe. safe. Absolutely a safe. You have a safe. You're locking it up. You and only you have the combination or key. It's done. So if you really need this medicine for a chronic issue and you know you're going to have it in the house, take away the temptation. Get a safe. By all means, lock it up. I tell my patients to do that all lock the time. Lock it up. Absolutely. Devil's advocate. Before you go to the next one, someone says, oh, come on, doctor, that's overkill, you say. Absolutely not. When it's there, it can be taken. And you don't want to risk anything with that. So lock it up. It takes two minutes. I tell patients that all the time. I expect my patients to do that. I, I ask them to. Second thing. The second thing you want to do, too, is when someone gives you a prescription, and uh, the good example is uh, my wife had to have some surgery last week. She's doing great. But the doctor handed me a prescription for 20 Vicodin. 
And I looked at him, I said, why are you giving this to me? And he said, well, I give it to everyone. This is just routine. And I said, well, what if she doesn't need that? What if she only needs four pills, five pills? He goes, well, you'll fill it and then you don't have to worry about it. But that's one of the perceptions I'm trying to break amongst my own colleagues to say, if you need to give someone something, that's fine, but why not give them five pills? They can always go to the pharmacy and get a little more, maybe 10, but 20? Why that number? So this is interesting. This is, I asked you for advice for parents, and you're now talking about advice for your professional colleagues, physicians. You're saying prescribe fewer prescription drugs and then refill if necessary. That's correct. And therefore, it takes the temptation of having the medicine in the house. With the parents, the number one thing is locking up the medicines. If you have extra medication, try to get rid of that medicine. I know it's, we don't want to flush it or dump it, but we need to get rid of it and get it out of the house. Bring it back to some physician's offices. They may have programs. Bring it to your police station. They will take prescription opioids. They'll be happy to take that. Uh, they're never going to say no to that, so right. I'd rather that. So there you're taking away the medicine from the kids, but now you have to start and take a step back even and say, how is the medicine getting into the house to begin with? There's a division of consumer affairs that actually yes. has these sites that they have. Yes. There are not enough of them. There are going to be more. That you can return the medicine. You can actually yes. go to this place. It looks like a mailbox. Yes. There are not enough of them, but the division of consumer affairs has them. You can go there, no questions asked. That's correct. And just put it in there and get rid of it. Because they know, because you can't bring it back, certain opiates... You are not allowed to return anything to a pharmacy. Once a the, narcotic. But yes. You, I, I could bring, let me ask you, I told you I have Bactrim right That's now. That's correct. Okay, for an antibiotic. I could bring that back to the, if the, the bottle was pharmacist. Un, if the bottle was not uh, broken open, if it was still sealed, they would take it back. Pharmacies don't take back medications once they leave the pharmacy themselves, oh. especially with controlled substances. They will not take them back. They don't want to know from them. Oh, boy. Um, all right, and one more thing for parents. What about parents talking to kids? Well, you have to absolutely have conversations. This is the old times when I was growing up, have yep. conversations, and the Nancy Reagan, I'm too old for that, but does say no. You need to educate them and say, listen, this medicine was given for a reason for this problem. If you're going to take this as a game, you're going to hurt yourself. It's good stuff, Dr. Kaufman. Uh, promise me this will not be the last time you come back to talk about this important subject. It is an epidemic. There are... Uh, Lots of ways we need to approach this. Thank you, Doctor. No, I'd love to come back. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. One-on-one. -on -one. We'll continue right after this. Thank you, Doctor. If you would like more information on this program or if you'd like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org, visit us online at oneonone.org, or find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Ph.D. I hereby declare the All Stars Project Scott Lamb Center for After School Development open for business. Great stuff. Uh, <laughs> Gloria Strickland is the director of the All-Stars Project of New Jersey. Uh, what was the video we were just looking at that you were introducing <laughs> these talented, terrific All-Stars? Well, that was the grand opening of the Scott Flam Center for After School Development, 9,000 square feet, downtown Newark, and it's wow. a wonderful space. Wonderful. For those who do not know what the All-Star Project is, tell everyone. Well, the All-Stars Project, we're a 30-year-old nonprofit organization, and 15 years ago, I opened the doors here in Newark, New Jersey. We reach out to young people in the poorest communities in Newark, of course, Irvington, uh, Orange, mm. East Orange, and what we do is we invite them to participate in our youth development programs, innovative development programs. Describe uh, exactly what that means. Break it down. What are some of the areas you focus on? Well, number one, development. That's key. And what we mean by that, development is a human being's having the capacity to see an opportunity and to, and to act on that opportunity. So that's important for us because young people in poor communities in inner city 
The world is small, it's narrow. You don't have as many possibilities mm -hmm. that you see. So at the All Stars, what we see our job is let's create a vast majority of opportunities. Let's bring new people together so these young people can experience the broader world and meet new people, interact with new people, and do some things differently. So interesting. Uh, you know that the program we run, our production company, the Caucus Educational Corporation, in addition to running this broadcast and the other ones, runs an off-the-air um, program called Stand and Deliver. Yes. Uh, communication, leadership, um, coaching, mentoring. Yes. It's similar without all the dance and the arts. And I look at your program and I have, have a feeling some of the, your kids are our kids. Yes, yes, you know absolutely. You Your kids are our kids. Absolutely. And I know you know our program and we know yours. These young people, who are they? What do they need? What do they want? Well, who are they? Uh, the young people are the kids out in the streets, mm. uh, in the neighborhoods. I mean, one of the things we do when we reach out, we go out to the neighborhoods. We How go out to that? the street. We take a group of young people. We stand on the corner. We have a clipboard. We have one of our programs called the All Stars Talent Show Network. And literally... Hold on. The All Stars... Talent Show Network. Go right out on the street. Right out on the street. <laughs> we might be on Broad and Market. It, that's in the heart of downtown Newark. That's right. Right by right, right. Macy's. <laughs> <laughs> or Bamburgers, what I used the, to call it. The, the old Bamburgers. <laughs> I was going to say, right, right there. Yes. By the way, what I used to call the old 27 bus goes yes, right down there. exactly. So you're right there, right there in the heart of America. What are you looking for? And we're looking for young people, and we're saying, do you want to perform? Are you want to perform? Do you want to perform? And young people, after young people, say, yes, 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 yes. Now, the interesting thing is, when they perform in our talent show, everybody makes the show. Everybody who comes to an audition we have a huge congratulations chorus, and we say to every single kid, no matter what they do on that stage, you made the show. And they walk off that stage with those smiles, and they walk off that stage saying, I came today and I gave mm. whatever I could give, and somebody clapped for me, Who's and in somebody the said, clapping? Yes. Oh, we have family members and parents, and we have 40, 50 volunteers in the mm. audience uh, clapping for them. And mm. that's so unusual. What does it mean to them? It means that there's a place where they can be. It means they don't have to be perfect and fit into a box to be somewhere and to be accepted and to be supported. I mean, this is important in development because if you're going to grow and you're going to develop, you have to have people embrace you where you mm. are. You have to support that you can perform on a stage, right? You can do hip hop, you can sing, you can rap, but also half of the people in that room are our volunteer youth who are running the shows. Now they're performing, handing out the, the mics, uh, dealing with the CDs, welcoming the guests. Those young people are also performing and they're creating something in the neighborhood mm. that's productive, that's creative. And we're saying if we can embrace you as a performer, we can support you playing and pretending and growing. And that's what it's about. Why is this personal to you? Oh, it's personal because I grew up poor. I grew up in Bayshore, Long Island in the 50s. I lived in a house that had no central heating, no hot water. We, we cooked on a coal stove. And things were tough. I mean, my parents wanted for me, but they didn't have the basics to give me. So here I am plugging away, angry, pissed off, because my at life home. wasn't what I wanted to be. I wasn't mad at my parents. <laughs> I wasn't mad at my parents. Right. I was mad at the situation that I just didn't have the basics. And I went to school, and <laughs> the school nurse, Mrs. Fortunato, I remember her today. I was a senior, and she said, what college are you going to? And I said with an attitude, I'm not going to college. My parents are poor. And she says, oh, yes, you are. You fill out that application, and we're going to find a way for you to do it. You know, she helped me apply. She helped me meet somebody and get a scholarship. Mrs. Fortunato. Mrs. Fortunato. And here I go off to Hofstra University. You went to Hofstra? Di didn't understand where I was. <laughs> Out on the island? Out on the island, <laughs> private college. And I'm like, this kid, you know, poor black kid, what am I doing here? But what I was doing there was a new performance, a new part of life. And, and I was a lucky kid. Well, all these kids in Newark and East Orange and Irvington, we just can't rely on luck anymore. There's too many of those kids that don't have enough Mrs. Fortunato. So you can't count on a Mrs. Fortunato just no, being there. No, not for the masses of kids. And right so that's now. what the All Stars. Yeah. That's why when I was talking to our mutual yes. friend Kevin Cummings, absolutely over at Investors, when he started talking about you, you can't yeah. count on Kevin's, the Kevin Cummings of the world, just 
you know, these benefactors who say, well, I'll step in. and I'll, Like, you can't count on that. Well, it's kind of interesting now. If you have an organization, as we do, the All Stars Project, where we reach out to caring supporters throughout the state That's of your New job. Jersey. That is That is your job. job to find exactly. caring people. So what I've done is I've found Kevins and more Kevins. We have uh, Robert Ross and Jackie Ross. Right. We have people from Tiffany and Company like Jim Fernandez. We have PWC. People we who have step people up. People who step up. And not only do they make contributions, which we need, and that's important, but there's something else these people do. They give of their time mm. and their energy. And when I say to a poor kid on the south side of Newark, you got to get out into the world because there's a world out there for you. Well, when Kevin Cummings says that to him, right. when you know Jim Fernandez says that right. to him, right. then he knows he is interacting with Why does that world. matter? Why does it oh. matter that they see that from a CEO who is very successful? And by the way, does it matter if that CEO is white or black? Well, I think it doesn't matter. I think it matters whether they're black or white. I think it matters if they are people who have a different part of world that they have access to and they're willing to give it to our kids. And I think one of the reasons it matters, it matters, is because we have to support our young people to have an opportunity to go through a process of growth. If they don't grow, mm. they won't appreciate the Kevin Cummings. They won't appreciate mm. uh, what's going on in the world. I know it sounds like a cliche, but I know you appreciate where it's coming from. Gloria, you are an absolute all-star. I want to thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Thank you. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating 25 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this edition of One on One has been provided by Activists, the New Jersey Education Association, Investors Bank, New Jersey Natural Gas, St. Peter's University, and by New Jersey Manufacturers Insurance Group. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. One on One with Steve Adubato has been produced in partnership with St. Joseph's Healthcare System. This program has been made possible in part by Franklin Templeton Investments. First Steps First day of school. First game. When their first day of college arrives, will you be able to pay for it? NJ Best can help. It is the 529 college savings plan for New Jersey families, and you can start saving today with as little as $25. To learn about NJ Best 529 college savings plan, its investment objectives, risks, and costs, read the investor handbook available at 877-755-GRAD or njbest.com.